Meantime, I want to shift gears a little bit over to the way that banks are getting criticized through all of this. Of course, a very different uh, problem we're dealing with than back in 2009 when banks were very much in uh, the spotlight here. But still a lot to be questioned over the way that it's treating uh, workers, frontline workers, as well as people who have loans in trouble, as well as, um, you know, all the other things out there and dealing with all the money flowing through the banks right now. And joining us for more on that is Nick Wiener, Committee for Better Banks lead organizer. And Nick, when we look at this, you guys were just out rating uh, how some of these banks have been doing on those fronts and, and not necessarily uh, any of the major ones earning a passing grade. What are they doing so poorly? Thanks, Eric. Uh, great to be here. Well, you know, I think the earnings uh, calls this week really hit home why we at the Committee for Better Banks conducted this scorecard, uh, grading the 12 of the largest retail banks on how they treat people, you know, their employees and individual customers during this pandemic, uh, you know, because it's a reflection of this disconnect in our economy between what's happening uh, with the stock market and Wall Street versus what most Americans are experiencing in, in their everyday lives. We saw profits on the investment banking side go up. And on the retail side, they're down. And a big reason is because the big four banks socked away about $28 billion to cover loan losses, uh, you know, because they're anticipating massive loan defaults. And with good reason, right? Last month, I think 30% of Americans missed their June housing payment. Uh, so a big question for us at the Committee for Better Banks, uh, right, which, as you mentioned, is a coalition of frontline bank workers from across the country, is what are the big banks doing to help prevent what some are warning could be a housing apocalypse over the coming months? So in our view, uh, they need to do as much as possible to prevent defaults and bankruptcies, uh, you know, and they can do this by extending the CARES Act forbearance policies across housing, auto and student loans. Yep. And help and help to maximize employment by not issuing any layoffs until we have a vaccine and making sure that they're implementing consistent uh, you know, worker protection so that frontline bank workers can serve customers who are stressed and anxious and yeah. about what's going to happen next. Well, I mean, I think a lot of those things would, would be ideal to see, but obviously a lot of companies right now are dealing with these struggles and, and banks, as you know, too, have to have to navigate all this, uh, you know, responsibly and in handling what loans could come down the pike. That's why we're seeing them do that. But I, I just need to point out here, too, in terms of a lot of these larger banks uh, saying that they would donate the net proceeds in terms of fees tied to those paycheck protection loans. We had highlighted before about twenty four billion dollars uh, in fees came from those. Uh, when you look at it, I mean, how does that kind of translate into these ratings? I just want to highlight a few of them here because you gave J.P. Morgan Chase a D, Bank of America a D, U.S. Bank an F, Wells Fargo an F. I mean, uh, are they at least not doing everything wrong? I, I, surely they must be doing something okay. So we, we did give them points for uh, charitable contributions, uh, but we set a high bar, right, to really highlight the need um, and the, and the uh, position the banks are in uh, today versus uh, right where they were 12 years ago, uh, you know, and thank goodness some of the uh, Dodd Frank protections are in place that that they're that they are better capitalized and in a position to um, uh, help in, in the economy right now. So we set a high bar. We wanted part of the problem is what we found through our analysis is that there's a patchwork of uh, policies that each bank uh, issued, and we thought. Uh, really, there's, there needs to be some consistency, transparency to reduce anxiety. And that's what we're hearing from bank workers. You know, initially, uh, you know, back in March, bank workers were saying, you know, uh, thought we're, we're being told there's no way you can telework because of federal banking regulations. Uh, and then suddenly there were uh, positive cases in, in massive call centers around the country. And it seemed like the next day, uh, tens of thousands of bank workers got laptops, were able to work from home. Uh, and so when, you know, uh, the need arises, the banks are able to meet the challenge. And mm -hmm. so we wanted to set a high bar because uh, we're in unprecedented times and, and we need, uh, you know, these banks, these major institutions that collectively the banks we looked at have eight and a half trillion dollars in assets, had $155 billion in net profits last year. Yeah. Uh, we need to do as much as we can to get through uh, this massive crisis, and, and we need their leadership. 
Yeah, no, a lot of a lot of questions around all this too, and obviously the Fed uh, getting hit with a lot of these questions as well. Uh, but Nick Weiner uh, joining us there from the Committee for Better Banks uh, as the lead organizer. Appreciate you taking the time to chat. That. Yeah, thanks for having me, Zach.